When I survey the wondrous cross where the young prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the cross of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Yes. What a sweet demand. It demands our all. Such a sacrifice for you and me. Welcome to the reading of the Word of God. Today is June the 9th. June the 9th. And we are reading in 1 Kings. Oh my goodness, we are enjoying David and his reign and all that happened. And such excitement starts today. Because today we're going to read about them beginning to build the temple. The magnificent temple during Solomon's time. Oh my goodness, I can't wait to read it all and refresh my memory. And so we will be in chapter 5. Chapter 5. First Kings chapter 5. <clears throat> Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon because he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father. For Hiram had always loved David. And then Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, You know how my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the wars which were fought against him on every side, until the Lord put his foes under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. And behold, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spoke to my father David, saying, Your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, he shall build the house for my name. Now therefore, command that they cut down cedars for me from Lebanon, and my servants will be with your servants, and I will pay you wages for your servants, according to whatever you say. For you know there is none among us who has skill to cut timber like the Sidonians. <clears throat> so it was when Hiram heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and he said, Blessed be the Lord this day. For he has given David a wise son over this great people. And then Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I have considered the message which you sent me, and I will do all for you, 
your desire concerning the cedar and the cypress logs. My servants shall bring them down from Lebanon to the sea. I will float them in rafts by sea to the place you indicate to me and will have them broken apart there and then you can take them away and you shall fulfill my desire by giving food for my household. And so here we have such a wonderful, wonderful arrangement that has the Lord's hand all over it. And then Hiram gave Solomon cedar and cypress logs according to all his desire. And Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household and 20 cores of pressed oil. And thus Solomon gave to Hiram year by year. So the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he had promised him. And there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty together. And then King Solomon raised up a labor force out of all Israel, and the labor force was 30,000 men. Can you imagine being boss over that many and getting it organized? Woo! That took the Lord's hand too, I'm sure. <clears throat> and he sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month in shifts. They were one month in Lebanon and two months at home. How wonderful. How wonderful. Didn't take them away very long from their families. Adoram was in charge of the labor force. Solomon had 70,000 who carried burdens and 80,000 who quarried stone in the mountains, besides 3,300 from the chiefs of Solomon's deputies who supervised the people who labored in the work. And the king commanded them to quarry large stones, costly stones, and hewn stones to lay the foundation of the temple. And oh, <clears throat> my wonderful trips to Israel, and I'm sure some of you out there can say the same thing too. You can go down underneath the foundation and you can stand there by those enormous stones and you just can't even believe how big and wonder how they ever managed all that. But God had them do it. It's just a marvelous thing. So Solomon's builders... Hiram's builders and the Gibeonites quarried them, and they prepared timber and stones to build the temple. And we move right along to chapter 6 of First Kings. And I'm going to keep grabbing a hot sip, if you don't mind today. And this glorious cup, that I love so much, given by a sweet, sweet sister in Christ. The gold, you see, starts with George Washington and goes around the cup, naming in succession all the presidents of the United States. And guess what? It had room at the end of the cup to put Donald J. Trump. And then no more room. I would like a sip. <clears throat> Chapter 6 of 1 Kings. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. Now the house which King Solomon built for the Lord, its length was 60 cubits, its width 20, and its height 30 cubits. The vestibule in front of the sanctuary of the house was 20 cubits long across the width of the house, 
and the width of the vestibule extended 10 cubits from the front of the house. And he made for the house windows with beveled frames. Oh, I bet they were just beautiful. Just beautiful. And guess what? They have these blueprints and their biggest desire is to get a, a firm hold of that temple mount and build the next temple. And they have everything already gathered up. The money, the supplies, everything. Against the wall of the temple, he built chambers all around. Against the walls of the temple, all around the sanctuary and the inner sanctuary. And thus he made side chambers all around it. The lowest chamber was five cubits wide. The middle was six cubits wide. And the third was seven cubits wide. For he made narrow ledges around the outside of the temple so that the support beams would not be fastened into the walls of the temple. Oh, very careful planning here. And the temple, when it was being built, was built with stone finished at the quarry so that no hammer or chisel or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. Can you imagine that? Everything built away and brought in so that there was not just noisy noise of building the temple. The doorway for the middle story was on the right side of the temple. They went up by stairs to the middle story and from the middle to the third. <clears throat> so he built the temple and finished it. And he paneled the temple with beams and boards of cedar. Oh, wow. Do you like to smell the smell of cedar? It's very refreshing. And he built side chambers against the entire temple, each five cubits high. They were attached to the temple with cedar beams. And then the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, Concerning this temple which you are building, if you walk in my statutes, execute my judgments, keep all my commandments and walk in them, then I will perform my word with you, which I spoke to your father David, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. Oh, hallelujah. And that is good news, isn't it? So Solomon built the temple and finished it. And he built the inside walls of the temple with cedar boards from the floor of the temple to the ceiling. He paneled the inside with wood and he covered the floor of the temple with planks of cypress. Wonderful, beautiful wood. And then he built the 20 cubit room at the rear of the temple from floor to ceiling with cedar boards. He built it inside as the inner sanctuary, as the most holy place. And in front of it, the temple sanctuary was 40 cubits long. The inside of the temple was cedar, carved with ornamental buds and open flowers. All was cedar. There was no stone to be seen. All of that under the earth. You have to go down to see the stone. And he prepared the inner sanctuary inside the temple to set the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord there. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 20 cubits high. 
He overlaid it with pure gold, pure gold, and overlaid the altar of cedar. So Solomon overlaid the inside of the temple with pure gold. He stretched gold chains across the front of the inner sanctuary and overlaid it with gold. The whole temple he overlaid with gold until he had finished all the temple. Also, he overlaid the gold, the entire altar that was by the inner sanctuary. Inside the inner sanctuary, he made two cherubim of olive wood, each 10 cubits high. One wing of the cherub was five cubits, and the other wing of the cherub five cubits. Ten cubits from the tip of one wing to the tip of the other. And the other cherub was ten cubits. Both cherubim were of the same size and shape. The height of one cherub was ten cubits, and so was the other cherub. And then he set the cherubim inside the inner room and they stretched out the wings of the cherubim so that the wing of the one touched one wall and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall and their wings touched each other in the middle of the room. Also, he overlaid the cherubim with gold. And then he carved all the walls of the temple all around, both the inner and the outer sanctuaries, with carved figures of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. And the floor of the temple he overlaid with gold both the inner and outer sanctuaries. For the entrance of the inner sanctuary, he made doors of olive wood. The lentil and doorposts were one-fifth of the wall. The two doors were of olive wood, and he carved on them figures of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers and overlaid them with gold. And he spread gold on the cherubim and on the palm trees. So for the door of the sanctuary, he also made doorposts of olive wood, one fourth of the wall. And the two doors were of cypress wood. Two panels comprised one folding door and two panels comprised the other folding door. And then he carved cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers on them, and overlaid them with gold applied evenly on the carved work. And he built the inner court with three rows of hewn stone and a row of cedar beams. In the fourth year, the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid in the month of Ziv, and in the eleventh year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, the house was finished in all its details and according to all its plans. So he was seven years in building it. God's favorite number there. Seven years in building it. Oh, hallelujah to the Lamb. <clears throat> Let me have another sip in between testaments. <clears throat> we move right along now to the New Testament, the New Covenant. And we are in the exciting book of Acts, all the start of the church, all the apostles, 
fulfilling their commission and building it up. So let's see where they are this morning. Reciting their history is what they're doing. They're reciting all the history in God. We are in Acts chapter 7, verse 1. Acts chapter 7, verse 1. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? And if you don't know what things that he's talking about, please go back and reread so that you understand. We're only into the book seven chapters. It wouldn't take long at all. And so what is the answer here to this question? Are these things so? And he, Stephen, said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran. And he said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives, and come to a land that I will show you. And then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans, and he dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way, that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God. I will judge. And that is a quote from Genesis 15, verse 14. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. And then he gave them the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Connie will tell you that it, that's a supernatural thing from God, that little boys born have more clotting ability in their blood on the eighth day. So there's no excessive bleeding to be circumcised. Not any other day, the eighth day. So he circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. And then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, 
the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. Remember, all the baby boys were to be drowned in the river. At this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffer wrong. He defended and avenged him who was oppressed, and he struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. But they did not understand. And the next day, he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? And then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. And we will leave off right there with the reading <clears throat> live. But you can read on, and I pray that you do. It's the most fascinating, wonderful story of God's people and all that happened to them in Egypt. All right, y'all, we move right along. <clears throat> Pardon me, to Psalm 127. We are reading this certain set of Psalms that have a title, actually, of songs of ascent and it all was involved with how they praised and worshiped and and kept going up and reading reading torah reading these psalms out loud and so these are from solomon and this is the eighth one we've read the first seven today the eighth psalm 127 Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And isn't that wonderful to read? Right after we've read the start and the building of the first temple. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city. The watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he gives his beloved sleep. Sleep. The Lord wants you to have sweet sleep every night. Restful, restoring sleep. This is If you're having a hard time sleeping, this is a wonderful psalm here for you to read. Claim these words and ask the Lord to help you. Behold, we move along to the new subject of children. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. Children which is a child as soon as the sperm hits the egg inside the lady. 
children are not to be hated and murdered in abortion. God says they are your heritage. You are destroying your own heritage. I can't tell you in my older years here, y'all, and I'm, I'm not ashamed to say I'm 84. My four daughters are rocks in my older years, making sure that I'm taken care of, making sure that I have what I need, calling to check on me. This is the way it's supposed to be in a family. And I know a lot of you have very sad, very sad events that have happened in your family where, where people are, are separated from one another. And I pray today for all of you who have that painful sorrow that God would answer your prayers and bring about all kinds of miracles of bringing your families back into fellowship, back into talking to one another and helping and celebrating and doing holidays together. These scriptures are so important. These scriptures are our everyday life. We're not reading some fairy tale here. We are reading what makes a happy family a happy life. So I'm going to begin with verse 3 again. Behold, that's an important word. Behold, take notice, listen up. Something very important for you to work on if things are a problem. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Now, does God want us to go about it in the right way that he has brought up? Yes. It's not called run around at night as unfaithful, sinful people. Having intercourse when you're not married, that's sin. That's not love. That's lust. God wants a commitment from a man and a woman. And I do mean a man that was born a man and a lady that was born a woman. That's what he wants. That's the happy life. The other life of sin is going to have all kinds of sorrow and God is laying a foundation, a pattern for happiness, for joy. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. And see, I had my children in very young time of my life. So I'm here to enjoy them, eight grandchildren, three great-grandchildren. What Now that's a heritage. And they are, every one of them, very dear. To, they, are my, they are my health. They are my joy. So are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. Full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. They will be the brave ones brought up with a strong foundational family who will be the brave ones in an army, will be the brave ones to go out and fight to have peace. Oh, I mean, there's such depth in these words that are, that are spoken today. Please, don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't let your mind wander. This is just a precious little time here. Let's wrap up today's reading with Proverbs chapter 16, 
verses 28, 29, and 30. Proverbs chapter 16, beginning with verse 28. And here, here's a little bit of the other side of the story. A perverse man sows strife. Strife. Separating people. Causing them to hate one another. Causing them to argue and, and have a, a life that is just filled with constant, constant uproars. And a whisperer separates the best of friends. Oh, did you hear blah, 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 blah. Don't let a whisperer cause you to turn your heart against someone. A perverse man sows strife, and a whisperer separates the best of friends. A violent man entices his neighbor and leads him in a way that is not good. As it's just plainly spoken. It's not good. He winks his eye to devise perverse things. Perverse. Look up the word perverse and read what it really means. He purses his lips and brings about evil. Evil. Too much of that. And our commission from the Lord <clears throat> is to win sinners whose lives are all messed up and bring them to Jesus just as they are, messed up. That's how we all came. We were leading our own lives. We thought we were so good. We had pride that just, why well, we had heads so big we can't get them through a door. And aren't you, aren't you the happiest, the happiest day of your life was the day the Lord rescued you from sin. And you might be sitting in a church, you might have sat in a church, I did, 33 years. I was in the church every Sunday. Played the organ, directed the choir, did all these things. Knew about the Lord. I would have told you I loved him. But then, I had a personal, born-again experience with the Lord at the age of 33. And now, I have a relationship. Now, every day, I know him more and more. And all of that is available for you. Just come as you are. Don't try to clean anything up. Just come. Just come. You're not, you don't know about tomorrow. So you better use today. Use today. This is your ticket to, re, to heaven, to repent. Which means just be sincere and have a time when you confess the sins you know about and ask him to reveal and cover by his blood that was shed for you all of the other sins that you don't know about. And he will. And you will have a wonderful new life in Christ Jesus. The, the difference will be like night and day. Please. Today, do that. Just simply, like I just explained. Say amen, and then expect miracles from him. Give him your life. He gave it to you. He knows best the plan that he has for you. Oh, hallelujah. I pray that many of you will do that today as fruit from his word in your life. <clears throat> Let's close with prayer. Father God, oh, how precious your word today, Lord. How exciting to read about the building of the temple. Father God, to, to read the history, all that beautiful, beautiful history of Abraham and how you sent him out. And then along came Moses. And 
how you established your people and brought them out of the bondage, gave them the land that they are on. It doesn't belong to anybody else. You gave it to them. All others are poachers. And so, Lord, we are living today to see you show your people how to not only live on the part they have right now, but, Lord, they are fighting the IDF army. I hold them up to you right now. I hold up Israel, first thing. And, Lord, I'd ask that you would be with your army, the IDF army. And, Lord, we are rejoicing today at, at, at the the pictures of four beautiful people, three three men and one lady, who a young man named El, Eleth Cohen, and I, I'm sorry if I pronounced his first name incorrectly, he fought for those four that you can see pictures of today, for their lives to be released as prisoners. He gave his life. He was killed in the saving of them. The four hostages. Handsome young man. Father God, we hold up his family. We hold up Mr. Cohen's family. We'd ask, Lord, you would send Rakakodesh, Holy Spirit, to them for such grieving. Lord, he willingly gave his life to fight for his people. And so, Lord, we're asking that you make a way always now for his precious family. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Father, I'd ask that you would lead and guide Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu, that you would not only keep strong protection of men around him everywhere he goes, but Lord, keep your heavenly hand upon him to do all that you want him to do as prime minister. Precious God, such a fine, wonderful man to lead your people. I have such respect, Lord, for Mr. Netanyahu. Please, Lord, keep his enemies from being able to do any harm to him. Lord, we'd ask that you would protect and, and lead on the IDF forces, that you would give them wise leadership to do exactly what you want them to do and to go where you want them to go. And Lord, they are moving on. They are covering the land. They are determined this time. All of the terrorist surprises will come to an end as they deal with their enemy. So Father God, anoint them for your purpose in your way. Protect, Lord, your people. And we will give you all the praise and all the glory. Lord, we hold up America and you are shaking it up. And Lord, we are happy. Lord, you are exposing the lies. You are exposing evil people. And their selfish gain is all they have in mind. Lord, we, we are believing that you will put good leadership in and get them out. Put them out and put good leadership in who loves America, who loves her people, who is never forgetting for one day that their main responsibility is to lead America in good ways. Lord, I'd ask that you'd hear all the prayers of all of these precious people who come, that all of their prayers would begin to have answers come, loved ones saved, people healed. Lord, we hold up every person who needs a physical or a spiritual healing or who needs deliverance from evil spirits. 
Father God, we'd ask that the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit minister today in wonderful ways. And all of God's people cried a hearty amen and went about your day praising God, thanking him. Amen. Amen. Love you all. Bye.